Welcome, and today we're going to be exploring the Silk Road, an old world trade route that runs all the way through Asia up to what is now Istanbul. The Silk Road is quite an intriguing aspect when we look at the route and the major cities that exist off the route. We'll find that there are many allusions to the old world in these great cities. For those of you who are new to this channel, I'm going to leave a link in the description in terms of our grand theories of what the channel proposes. For today, this is going to be primarily a showcase of this stunning architecture that exists along the route of the Silk Road, or the Silk Route, that existed in the first century. Looking at the Silk Road, we can see that it runs all the way from China bisecting Asia from east to west, and then ending up at what is today Istanbul. And when the Silk Road started, this was Constantinople, originally a major city of the Roman Empire, and then subsequently the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, or Byzantium as it was called by historians, even though it was never referred to that by contemporaries at the time. Constantinople, an intriguing city that became Istanbul, and we'll be taking a close look at it. We'll be following the route from Constantinople through what is now Syria, and we have explored Palmyra before, to Baghdad, Iraq, and we'll be taking a close look at Baghdad. When we look at how extensive the route is, we have to consider the terrain that it passed through and the time frame that we're told that it did. These were supposedly caravans that traveled for months and even years back and forth along this route to bring silk from China all the way to Constantinople and ultimately into Europe. We're going to be taking a close look at the city of Mashhad in northeastern Iran, and then the old city of Merv, or at least the ruins of it. These were major cities that existed on the Silk Road. It's intriguing to consider that the Silk Road runs like a circuit cable from China all the way to Constantinople at the time and into Europe, much in the same way that the fictional Nung River ran through Vietnam to allow Captain Willard to reach Colonel Kurtz in his journey in the film Apocalypse Now. There's another interesting aspect when we look at the Silk Road, and this is what it looked like in the first century common era, as they call it. The land route that ran through the vast tracts of arid terrain, the many deserts and various high elevations. It had to be very challenging to get camels and horses and whatever else they had with wagons to transport this, silk. Silk was what really drove the Silk Road, taking it from China to every other location in the known lands at that time. I find it interesting that they were able to keep an active trade route going, and there are other accounts that they had sea routes going at that time in the first century, and the Silk Road was very active all the way up until about the 15th or 16th century, depending on what source you look at, which is really about the time that the Renaissance was in full swing in Europe. And some sources would say that it was the connections brought about by the Crusades and reconnecting Europe to the lost civilization of antiquity. Well, let's begin by looking at Istanbul, the city formerly known as Constantinople. Istanbul, or Constantinople, has a very deep history to it, and it's well documented that this was originally a major city of Hellenistic culture, the meeting point or nexus between Rome and Greece. And it would also be the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire until the Western Roman Empire fell. And then Constantinople remained as the capital of the Roman Empire until it too fell to the Ottomans in the 15th century. So the official history says. We have a lot of very intriguing and unique structures that exist. The least of which are the fortifications of Constantinople, the so-called Theodosian Walls. Very thick walls that enabled the city to survive many sieges. The city was constantly under a state of siege from other powers, or so we're told, and it even consists of this unique cistern that exists underneath the Hagia Sophia, the main temple that was originally built by Christians and then converted into a mosque once the Ottomans captured the city. The cistern was even featured in the movie From Russia with Love, with Sean Connery starring as James Bond. Remember when James Bond actually seemed to enjoy what he did and wasn't always depressed? Okay, back on topic. The cisterns are very unique, and they show us very well-built pillars and arches underground where water runs. And this is exactly where the cistern is laid out in conjunction with the Hagia Sophia and the Hippodrome. And we can see that there were a lot of different architectural stylings and unique aspects that were employed to build this city. 
We have many different renderings or paintings of what it looked like in the distant past, and we can see it may have appeared more Roman. But is that really the way it appeared? Or is that just the way that we're shown that it appeared? Like I've always said, this channel considers all accounts, and we do consider the fact that the historical account may be accurate. However, Constantinople is one of the cities in the past before it became Istanbul that seems to tell a very different story. A story that conflicts with what we're told in the historical account, because we do see older type of buildings that we seem to be concealing with newer buildings. The Hagia Sophia, for example. We're told that originally this was a Christian building and it was converted into a mosque once the Ottomans conquered Constantinople and renamed it Istanbul. We have a painting of what it likely looked at, but looked like before the minarets were added. A very unique dome with wonderful details behind it. When you look a little more closely though at a lot of the building material in Istanbul, what used to be Constantinople, you can see that it almost looks as though it's been subjected to some sort of terrific forces in many places. And you have to ask the question, how old are a lot of these stone layouts? How old is that cistern? Yes, we have an idea of when it was built and when these columns were built, and you can even see it in the movie From Russia with Love, where uh, James Bond's host even tells him. Looking at the walls and seeing the fine bricks and detail that went into this construction, it's very impressive, and we're told this was a fine fortification that defended the city. Going back to the cistern, though, you can also see that there seems to be the same kind of brick construction that goes into the many arches that are supported by these columns. This is very impressive construction. And then, of course, we look at another one of these paintings and renderings where we see more of the Roman flavor, if you will, of what used to be Constantinople. Again, seeing more domes, and of course we're told that dome equaled Roman or Greek at the time. Going back to the walls, you can also see that a lot of the blocks maintain their original appearance, and it seems as though there's been little renovation done on these walls over the years. Going back to the cistern, it also consists of many strange statues and depictions, and this is supposed to be a statue of Medusa's head that's upside down as part of this column. Very intriguing as to what that represents. Looking at this rendering of the Hippodrome, or this painting, and we can see some of the other Roman architecture and how it may have appeared. Once again, though, we have to question the accuracy of this account, because there's other drawings and renderings that show this portion of a ruined Hippodrome, and we have an obelisk and columns, and other smaller obelisks and columns. So what was really going on? Here's what the Hagia Sophia looks like today, now that it's been converted into a mosque with the many minarets added. And another question I have is, were those minarets indeed added, or were they part of the original structure? The walls also maintain their parapets, and what we're told officially is how the city was able to survive for so long, even though Constantinople existed in a state of siege. Let's go from Constantinople to Baghdad, proceeding south and southeast on the Silk Road. Baghdad is an intriguing city that was originally built around the Kadamiya Mosque, or so we're told. Baghdad was originally known as the Round City, and it was considered very advanced for its time. We have many different renderings, depictions, paintings, and sketches that show Baghdad being an extremely advanced city. A holy site for the Shia sect of Islam, and this was the origin of the entire city of Baghdad. Called the Round City, and yet we see that... Many of the impressive examples of architecture continue to endure to this day. A series of mosques and many other supporting structures across Baghdad give it the indication that this once was a very magnificent city. Here's a closer look at the Kadamiya Mosque as it exists today in all its glory, still at the center of the Kadamiya district in Baghdad and the center of the original round city of Baghdad. We also see that there's many other impressive examples of architecture in Baghdad, whether it's a tomb, it's a shrine, it's a mosque. We have many great, well-decorated towers with unique blocks. And yet it's been unfortunate that Baghdad has been subjected to many conflict over the decades. We see that uh, it's very impressive that many of these structures have survived all this different external and internal forces that have provided physical danger to these buildings. Yet many of them survive, bearing wondrous domes and minarets and incredible detailed arches that have been constructed on the buildings. The original round city of Baghdad was quite an impressive layout in and of itself. A unique grid pattern based on a circle. Something that seems to reflect a, an old world architecture, and we do have drawings and renderings of what the 
original aspect of Baghdad. Now, today, this is the Kadamiya district of Baghdad, which is built around the Kadamiya shrine and the very complex terrain that is found in and around it, which is now a marketplace. It's impressive, though, looking at the layout and the design of what Baghdad was, and we're looking at a time frame that was well over a thousand years ago. There's other impressive edifices within Baghdad, such as this public library with its very impressive dome and cupola, entryways, and walls. We also see other structures that may be used for residential purposes, and we can see the advanced architectural stylings of columns that are integrated within a very well-decorated wall on two floors. And this certainly looks legitimate. We see the gold-covered domes of the Kadamiya Shrine and the minarets around it, and this is an impressive structure that endures to this day and is the centerpiece of Baghdad and the Kadamiya district. We also have many other mosques and religious buildings, along with supporting buildings that show columns and arches and the advanced architecture that we find ourselves somewhat surprised to see. This is a concept drawing of what Baghdad may look like in the future, but I wonder if this is actually a concept drawing of what Baghdad could have looked like in the past. We have many different accounts of what a wondrous and otherworldly city Baghdad was in the distant past. And I'm not beginning to wonder if a lot of these renderings and these drawings are showing us a different picture of what it may have actually looked like at the height of its glory. A lot of people think of Baghdad as this, as this is the primary footage that you'll see out of it. At least you did see out of it when it was featured more prominently in the news, with many brutalist architecture buildings. But there's so much more to it when you look deeper into Baghdad, where you see the surviving mosques and the newer mosques with their domes and their minarets, and the very impressive architecture that went into them. The explanation is the same as you'll find in any other city across the land. Political leaders looking to influence religious leaders and providing them grants and money and looking to build up their legacy. I'm still impressed, though, by how so much of these buildings and the details within them endure, such as looking at the dome on this mosque and the minaret, along with the details in the walls and the arches, and each of the definitive blocks that go into it. We can find older paintings that show that this glory of Baghdad's architectural achievements have always been around. So what was the exact origin date behind all these buildings? I'm told that the mosque and a lot of them may be over a thousand years old. How old are they really? Are they that old or are they older? Is the Kadamiya Mosque something from a completely different time? Well, even going off the official account, it's something from a completely different time. In the game Assassin's Creed, they even tried to depict what Baghdad looked like at the height of its glory. And we see a very impressive and otherworldly city that defies simple explanation. Even to this day, looking at many of the mosques and other structures in Baghdad, you will see the beauty of detail and art integrated in every wall, every arch, and every window. And now we go to Mashhad, which is built around the Imam Reza Shrine, another circular city, just like Baghdad, and another holy Shia city, much like the Kadamiya district in Baghdad. It's very intriguing to think, though, that these cities are many miles apart, with Mashhad being located in northeast Iran. Here's where it is exactly, and we're moving further east on the Silk Road, and Mashhad at its intersection point today between Iran, Afghanistan, and Turkmenistan, which we did explore Ashgabat on another exploration on this channel. This shrine is just every bit as impressive as the one we just looked at in Baghdad, and in some ways, it has even more architectural styling and artistic detail within the building, as you see looking up at this arch. It seems as though no detail was spared, not only on the structure, but also in the painting. I've never quite seen anything more beautiful with a combination of colors inside a building. I can see why these buildings have such a spiritual effect on people. And you even look at the doors and the grandeur of how they're decorated. Every detail seems to be considered, and it seems to inspire the human spirit when you go in and out of these buildings. Just looking at them almost feels like you're transported to another world, another dimension. And I think this is one of the aspects that we tend to miss when we think of this particular area of the world, because we oftentimes focus only on the conflict that we don't see all the innate beauty within these buildings. This is truly extraordinary, and I think the only place I've seen that matches this is going back to our exploration of Moscow or St. Petersburg. Looking here at the interior of this dome is extremely impressive, where you see each of the arches, the lights, and then also the way the walls and the ceiling are decorated. 
The outside is no less impressive looking at the dome and the arches here as well. But then there's also the way that the walls and the dome are decorated on the outside. I wonder how this was originally done. Looking at a major hotel in Mashhad, the Ghazla Hotel, I believe it is called, we do see an interesting consideration where this hotel was supposedly built at the start of the 21st century. Now, are these genuine architectural stylings, or are these merely a facade? Was this a building that existed in the distant past and was renovated, or was this actually a building that was just built at the start of the 21st century and was brought up to look like an old world building? It's hard to say. But I integrate it within the presentation here because it's important to distinguish between these two types of buildings. If you just look at this hotel, you get the feeling this very well could be an old world building. But it could also simply be a facade or simply trying to replicate an old world building. It would be very interesting to go here in person and actually check what the construction materials are to ascertain exactly what we have going on here, especially within this lobby because we do see some very impressive architectural detailing. The outside of this hotel is very impressive as well because there are some of the details that we've noticed in many other outstanding and stunning structures, such as the small dome, the pediment, and even some of the columns. So what's really the story with this hotel? Well, if you've been in through or around this area, let me know in the comments, or just based on your observations and own research, or even your intuition, which is important as well. This is what Mashad looked like before they started to modernize, as they say, the shrine or the mosque in the area. And it still looks like it was very beautiful in the past. Going back to the hotel, you can see that the dome and the columns factored together very well, but it almost looks like we can tell that perhaps this is a bit more of a facade than some of the genuine construction that we've seen in older buildings. This most certainly is not a facade. And here we can see on the interior of one of the main domes the beauty and the decoration looking up within it. This is something that really defies the ability of words to describe. And then looking at the numerous exterior photos of this mosque, and you can see that even the floor has a very stunning beauty to it where it reflects these lights. And then, of course, the way they decorate each of the arches on these doorways. And a lot of times, just going through and around these buildings, even in looking in photographs or in live imagery, you find yourself just stunned by the beauty that you see. There's clearly much more going on here, and the standard explanation will be that this is a religious building that politicians supported over time. Even the original mausoleum has a beauty to it, even looking at the older photographs, which don't even have color to them. They still convey the sense of artistic integration and an architectural capability that seems to be beyond a lot of the things that we are either motivated to do or capable of doing in our contemporary era. Looking at the beauty of the gold dome and then the arched entryway and then the tower behind it, there seems to be so many more things that are hidden within this incredible shrine. And when we consider the fact that the account says that Mashad was originally built around it, it adds to many questions that we have. Going back to the hotel, though, it almost seems puzzling to look at some of the details on the inside. Is this real? Is this an old building? We know that the mosque is most certainly a legitimate and genuine building, and so we compare and contrast it with what we see to the hotel. Which one feels more genuine? Which one does our intuition tell us is the true old world building? Looking at the greater Mashad area, we can see that this is a modern city that we're told is expanding very rapidly and has done very well economically in more recent times. Back to the exterior of the mosque, we can see more of the exterior architectural details, but then they also had the ability to put in small gazebos and towers in and through and around this very incredible mosque. And you can see on the outside in many plazas across Mashhad, which is considered Iran's holiest city, why it is considered as such. The mosque itself just is not something that we can easily explain, especially if we concern ourselves with its original construction date. Outside, we can see that there's even more complicated integrations of architectural styles and the way that it was built. Going back to the hotel, it does give us the impression that there's more going on with the complicated spiral staircase. 
So I'll ask you to compare and contrast the mosque and the hotel and see if you can determine which one's different. It should also be noted that Mashhad has its own definition of brutalist buildings that seem to be going up. So I guess it's really a modern city after all. And now we're going to look at random towers and tombs along the Silk Road in northeastern Iran. And we have some very impressive towers. What's unique about this is we have to remember that we are in a very remote, isolated, and arid area. So it would be difficult to construct structures such as this, especially in the time frame that we're told that they're constructed. 700 to 900, common era, as they like to tell us. But who knows for sure. When we look at some of these structures and the blocks that were used to build them out, we can see that they also have dome structures on them as well. Built with blocks, it is very impressive. And not just that, there's also many towers that are isolated. Now some of these we're told are shrines, they're tombs, they're to commemorate some very famous religious leader or some sort of prophet or other individual. This one looks very familiar, this particular tower, with the way the columns are integrated into the wall and then underneath the roof. It's amazing that this is still standing. And I'm also reminded of the Garfield mausoleum that we looked at when we explored Cleveland in Ohio. Why is there so much similarity between these two buildings? Is it just a coincidence? What's your explanation for this? There's many other interesting architectural stylings within Iran. And of course, we're told that it was the location of the Persian and the Sassanid empires. We see there are other examples of these towers with these unique blocks and bricks that are fashioned together in very unique and intricate patterns. It shows an advanced know-how. This tower, we're told, is a tower of a Jewish individual named Daniel. This is called the Tower of Daniel that stands in Iran. And this structure still stands today. This would certainly be an interesting structure to explore and ascertain exactly what the construction material is. It looks very beautiful and very modern. It almost looks like it's from some sort of fantasy world. We can see that some of these towers do exist in the urban areas, and they do show a different architectural styling than what we see from the mosques. There's also even more ornate details where we have the way these blocks are all stacked together in these beautiful and intricate patterns. And look at those almost knotted rope patterns with the bricks at the top of the columns going into the roof. This is extremely impressive, and I would be very interested to see exactly how this was done originally. This is beyond the ability of words to describe, and it would be interesting to see someone actually stacking all these blocks or bricks. And what exactly is this material originally made out of? Is this sandstone? Is this some type of concrete? Or are these just bricks in the way that we think of bricks, looking at this tower? Yet we see other intricate details and stylings on these beautiful towers, and they're array of functions, whether it's to commemorate some religious figure or some political leader in the distant past. These are very impressive, and if these are indeed over a thousand years old, given the effects of natural erosion, and there is some extreme wind erosion in the arid environment, you also have to consider the fine dust and sand, how is it all these towers, all these columns, all these pillars that still stand today are holding up so incredibly well? A lot of them almost look as though they're brand new in some ways. Yes, you can see the erosion of dust and the staining on them, but yet the structural integrity, the fact that there's still so much detail, is very impressive. Never quite seen anything like it. And here, even looking at this tomb of the previous rulers of the long-gone Persian Empire, at least that's what we're told this particular site is, and look at how they supposedly carved out some of these tombs within the side of the rock. Is that what indeed really happened? Or is there some other explanation for the existence of these tombs here? And even this cube structure and part of this mausoleum. Never quite seen anything exactly like this. And this seems to be a lot of effort to go through for a tomb. Now, of course, being kings of the Persian Empire, perhaps it would make sense. And here we have the Tower of Silence. The Tower of Silence was supposedly a Zoroastrian burial site, the religion of Zoroastrianism, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Apparently, they believe that, and this is a very morbid account, the bodies of their dead had to be picked clean by buzzards or other scavengers, and they would arrange the bodies in this Tower of Silence for the scavengers to do the work and pick their 
bodies clean of flesh, and then the bones would be deposited into a pit at the bottom. There is supposedly one older picture that depicts this, but it's hard to say if this is a true account or if there was something else that was going on. We're also told that the current proponents of this religion no longer practice this burial. Regardless of what the truth is, this is a very impressive structure. And we can see that the fact that this is held up for, again, over a thousand years, as many of these other structures, it's impressive. Going back to the necropolis, though, of the old Persian dynasty, we can see the different vaults of each of the rulers and where they're buried. I also find it interesting that they know one of them has an unfinished tomb, although it looks like they made some progress on it. And then, of course, we have the little cube building there to the left. What's really going on here? What's the actual origin to this? Again, these towers are all extremely impressive, even with the protruding aspects of their side walls. How exactly were they built? How were they built with such precision? Why do they stand well today? We end the exploration by looking at the ruins of Merv, and we're in the same general vicinity of northeast Iran, close to the border of Turkmenistan, in that area between there and Afghanistan. Merv is known for its ruins that have a very peculiar look to them. You'll see that there are many blocks and bricks that made up what was once a great fortress. At least that's what we'll be told it is. Here in this old photo from the 19th century, we see a very peculiar pile of many bricks and rubble with this particular structure. Now, what actually causes something to rubble like that? Well, we'll be told it's the effects of time, such as with this fortress. This fortress that has the appearance of being melted. Well, perhaps that's just what happened from sitting out in the sun in the desert for over a thousand years. Yet you can see other structures that are supposedly from the same time frame that have held up extremely well, where you can see each of the individual bricks, you can still see the domes, and even the areas that protrude, and the concave and convex areas. This is all very impressive architecture, and it's even more impressive when we consider the fact that this is an isolated area in the middle of an arid region, and it's very thoroughly studied to this day. Looking on the inside of these ruins, we can see that this is brick or block of some type, and that there are still modern researchers who are trying to ascertain the exact dimensions and composition of these buildings. Here you can see the remnants of the fortress wall, and we can see blocks towards the base, and yet the walls are very impressive. Is there some sort of facading that's put around the bricks, or was it some other construction technique? The fact that so much of this fortress still stands after what it's been subjected to is extremely impressive, and it reflects the craftsmanship and the architectural capability of whoever originally built this fortress. This is supposedly called the temple or the building of ice for some reason, and of course on the outside it looks very melted. I, again, I can't imagine why, if it's just because it sat on the sun. Yet on the inside, I'm reminded of those amazing kilns that John Levi explored in Utah. This almost looks like a much larger one with the same kind of brick layout. And then there's still other ruins where we can still see the bricks making up part of the walls. Overall, Merv is a very extraordinary location. It's something I would enjoy exploring on the ground to really get an idea of what is still standing there, what's the actual composition of these blocks, and how well this overall site fits together to this day. It's a testament to what came in the past was truly able to achieve. This is one of the oldest remaining artificial structures that were admitted to by the mainstream is artificial in Merv, and it's very intriguing in how it reflects yet another circular pattern, and it reminds us of how when we looked at the earlier layouts of both Baghdad and Mashhad, we saw the same circular pattern. Again, many different blocks and bricks in this old building. And yet on the inside, you can still see a lot of the beautiful decorations. And remember, this is just a building sitting out in the middle of a very arid area, isolated. It still retains this kind of beauty. And even on the outside, with all the details that go in the domes and all the small arches and You'd call them windows, but really access points into the dome. It's impressive architecture, and it's even more impressive it endures to this day. Well, later today, we're going to be conducting a live stream exploration, myself and Old World Exploration, and you are cordially invited. Please join us and see the link on the site. Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe.